Okay, uh, my name is Mohammed Sami. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today. And I would like to thank the Egyptian Society for uh, Engineers. And I'm honored to stand in front of my uh, professors. Uh, uh, of course, Professor Rifai, Professor Reem, Professor uh, Fatma Ashur, and before he left, Professor Ahmed Gaber. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, started the R&D at UOP in the US and then I moved to field services so we used to help refineries and petrochemical companies to start up their units and troubleshoot any issues and then I moved to the business side so I'm sales manager for UOP based in Dubai and I cover uh, Kuwait and I cover petrochemicals business in Egypt so today I'll be talking about uh, refinery of the future. I'll talk about uh, outlook for refining globally. I'll talk about opportunities and imperatives for petrochemicals production. And I'll talk about our view, UB's view, of how the refinery of the future should be. Okay, so it all started in 2016. If you look at the chart here on the left, or in this case in your right, you'll see this is IMO, International Maritime Organization. And they said in October 2016, any bunker fuel has to have sulfur that's less than 0.5% effective January 2020. So two months from now. So this is huge, huge change in the refining industry because it means what we're talking about, the world it consumes maybe 5 million barrels per day of bunker fuel. Now they have to comply with this half percentage of sulfur content. So between 2017, moving to the chart here on, on, on the left, between 2017 and 2020, there is 1.1 million barrels per day of fuel gas that's being displaced. So, going from high sulfur fuel oil, refiners are left with a dilemma. What can they do with this, right? Because it can no longer be used as a bunker fuel. So, refiners have options. They can go and make transportation fuels. They can make uh, gasoline or diesel. Uh, or they can go and make naphtha and downstream petrochemicals. So, next slide, I'll be talking why it makes much more sense to go into petrochemicals. So, the first chart on the left here talks about gasoline demand between 2016 all the way till 2014. So if you look at the overall, the whole stack represents gasoline demand. It's growing, right? But as a matter of fact, a big portion of this is being reduced because of EVs, electric vehicles, and because of the increase in engine efficiency of what we call fuel economy. So you hear a lot electric vehicles and how they're going to impact gasoline demand. Not really much. What's truly impacting gasoline demand is the improvement in the fuel economy. 20 years ago, we used to drive cars that consume maybe 20 liters for every 100 kilometers. Nowadays, we're talking about six and five, and some areas in Europe, they even go below four liters for every 100 kilometer. So what does this mean? It means that the world needs less gasoline. The case for making more transportation fuels is becoming very weak. Uh, if we look on the other side, petrochemicals, looking at, uh, at this chart here, if we focus on the last five bars, which represent petrochemicals, ethylene, propylene, uh, benzene, parazylene, or naphtha, 
you'll see is that the compound annual growth rate is positive. For fuels, so-so, mostly negative. But for uh, petrochemicals, it's growing very strongly. So now, those refiners who don't know what to do with uh, uh, fuel oil, I think the better option is very clear, is to venture into petrochemicals. So this leads us to this slide here, which talks about the new trends in refining. What we're used to is the, the first section, which is a conventional refinery, which is a refinery that's making transportation fuels. That's our Midor, our Enerpic. Uh, you get crude and you make gasoline, diesel, and jet. And then there are some independent petrochemical companies, like uh, CD Crave, right, with ethylene crackers, and now they are going to do a propane dehydrogenation. They're producing petrochemicals, but they're really independent and separate from the refiners. Same case with ELAB in Alexandria. They get the kerosene, and then they make the linear alkyl benzene. So this is our case here in Egypt. Things are changing. And we know many here in Egypt are thinking about moving to the second stage, which is integrated refining and petrochemicals complex. So in, in, in this scheme, you have petrochemicals production integrated with your refining, with your refinery. And this is a trend globally, not only in Egypt. We recently, uh, customers like Kuwait, Kipik, uh, they're already building a refinery with uh, that's integrated refining and petrochemicals. What's really exciting is what's happening next, which is crude to chemicals. You basically are producing very small amount of uh, fuels, and you're focusing on making petrochemicals. You're converting as much as possible of your crude to petrochemicals. This is happening now, right? I'll show you later. This is not just on paper. This is, this is happening now. But we are convinced as UOP that this is the future of refining, crude to petrochemicals. And it's, it's very simple because the value that you can extract from crude by converting it to petrochemicals is much higher than using it as an energy source. Refiners around the world, when I talk to customers, they no longer look at crude as a source of energy. They look at crude as molecules, and how they can extract the most value from those molecules by going to petrochemicals. So refinery of the future is flexible. Is it adapts to changes in the market. If there is an opportunity to make some fuel, you can adjust the operation and make some fuel. You can switch between ethylene and propylene and different petrochemicals. So this is one main characteristic of the refinery of the future. Second, is it integrated with petrochemicals? It has to be. This is the only way you can make maybe more than maybe 30 additional dollars from each barrel of crude. Huge value uh, for integration with petrochemicals. It is connected, and this is an area where Honeywell is really focusing. Honeywell is a software company, and UOP is a world leading process licensor. So we combine forces and we offer connected solutions that help operators to operate those complex uh, refiners. Uh, so when we, receive, when we talk to our customers, someone says we're interested in revamping our refinery to make petrochemicals or starting a new refinery, we focus on six efficiency metrics. Number one is carbon. It's very important that every molecule in your crude goes to the right process unit. Right? You want aromatics to go straight to your aromatics complex. You don't want to uh, mess with the aromatic ring, and so on. So first thing we focus on is your feed definition and how we send each molecule to the right process unit. 
we focus on hydrogen, so how we can prepare a configuration that balances hydrogen from the feed and minimize on purpose hydrogen production. Utilities, of course. Emission, which is becoming more and more important. And uh, water, you minimize uh, water usage or water consumption in the refinery. And of course, capex, you want to make this, this uh, refinery and build it with the lowest possible capex. So this is our focus at UOP, how we can get to the refinery future by looking at those six efficiency metrics. So next slide I'll show you uh, an example of what we're talking about. I know many people here are technical. Uh, so uh, this is a typical refinery that's making fuels. You have a delayed cooker, you have an FCC, uh, diesel hydrotreater, naphtha complex, CCR, an isomerization unit, and then you have a C4 complex that's making alkylate and MTBE. So if you want to make this refinery produce more petrochemicals and help them bridge themselves from today's status to be a more profitable and viable business. That's what we, what we would do. First is our Uniflex technology. We will replace the cooker with Uniflex technology. It's a slurry, slurry hydrocracker. And we will see next more about Uniflex, but it's truly a breakthrough technology. We were talking about conversion. Uh, with Uniflex, well, I'll show you later the yield of Uniflex, but we're talking about 97%. So, and, and this is commercial, you're correct, this, this is commercial proven. There is a unit in Canada ran for 15 years. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit more on, on Uniflex to address your question. Uh, uh, but also what we're doing with Uniflex, we're no longer making coke. With a coker, you make maybe 30% coke. You sell it for $62 per ton. Now, you install Uniflex, you make naphtha, you sell it for $650 per ton. 10 times the value. Uh, what, we, what we would do also is that we can add a hydrocracker to maximize naphtha production because naphtha is the feed for petrochemicals. Uh, definitely an aromatics complex. Now that we're getting more naphtha, we can uh, uh, make it uh, go to aromatics. Toluene methylation is a new technology by UOP. What it does, it maximizes your parazidine production at the expense of benzene, which is a less desired product. Steam cracking, uh, so you'll send your LPG to a steam cracker, make ethylene propylene. Uh, you can send your propane to a propane dehydrogenation unit, like what SIPPIC is doing, and make propylene and also get some hydrogen. Uh, higher severity FCC, high severity FCC will help you to make more propylene and also you'll produce some gasoline. We have a very interesting technology called OCP, olefin cracking process. It takes a C4 to C8 olefin stream and produces ethylene and propylene. Maxine is a great technology that helps refiners to reduce the steam cracking, cracking size. If you look at this configuration, the steam cracking is one of the most capex intensive pieces of uh, equipment. So by Maxine, you send more normal paraffins to your steam cracker, which means you reduce the size. So it helps with the steam cracker economics. Uh, back to Uniflex, because in my opinion, it's, it's a key technology here that will drive towards refinery uh, of the future. So I'm comparing here two technologies, Coker technology to Uniflex technology. Coker, 
if you look here at the percentage yield, you're making 31% coke. You're wasting your crude as coke. You go to Uniflex, you make 98% products. So what you're doing is that you're moving carbon from coke or pitch to valuable products. So you're making mostly diesel and, and, and VGO and also your naphtha, LPG, and then lighter ends. Uh, I'm going a little bit fast because I'm short on time, but uh, just very quickly, that's what Uniflex scheme looks like. It's basically a slurry hydrocracker, so you feed the vacuum residue to a Uniflex reactor, then you have a fractionation section, and then a hydrotreater. This slide is more interesting. Uh, so we said, we talked about the importance of producing naphtha. Now with Uniflex, you did something great, which is that you're making more distillates. But then if you really want to make more naphtha for petrochemicals, you can integrate a hydrocracker with the Uniflex technology. So this is here typical Uniflex uh, yield. Now, you take the diesel and vacuum gas oil and then you process it through a hydrocracker and then you get mostly naphtha. So out of this here, which is uh, like 70% of the Uniflex yield, you're getting 85% as naphtha. So this is, this is why Uniflex is leading the transition into uh, petrochemicals. It's economically justifiable. I have a slide on, on economics of Uniflex. Next. So, uh, here, here you are. So, this here talks about you economics. So, on the left axis, you have the net cash margin as dollars per barrel of crude. And on the right axis, we have the IRR, internal rate of return. So, this is the base case. This is the gray here is the refinery making fuels. Now, if you add Uniflex, look at the red dot. Your IRR just went from 15 to almost 25. And it's mainly because what I said, you got rid of Coke, which is undesired byproduct. If you add a hydrocracker to crack uh, the VG to naphtha, you get a little bit more. If you add a distillate hydrocracker, you get more. And then if you add it to wind methylation to your aromatics complex, make more parasite, you make more. Uh, this is also follows the same lines, is how red is the percentage conversion to petrochemicals. So here, this is just a base case. Maybe you're making 20%. You add Uniflex, you, you start to make naphtha. But then with adding the hydrocrackers and to wind methylation, you get almost close to 100% petrochemicals, which is, represents UOP's view of the refinery of the future. Two minutes, perfect, yeah. So, key message here, since I'm having, I have only two minutes, is this is happening now. This is happening now. We, this unit here, this configuration is starting up next year in China. And we, around the world, we have customers in different stages of design or construction for similar configurations. Uh, so this is uh, Zhongu Petrochemicals in China starting up next year. It has our Uniflex integrated with a diesel hydro treater. And then it has an FCC naphtha block. And then it has aromatics complex, Oloflex, and steam cracker cracker complex. So those guys maybe make at least 50, 60 percent of their crude is converted into uh, petrochemicals. Uh, I'll check and get back to you exactly. It's a world scale, uh, world class complex, so I'll, I'll get back to you. So this is a conclusion. Uh, petrochemicals integration is the way forward. I'm very happy to see my own country, Egypt, people are talking about this seriously and I'm aware of different groups discussing the ideas. 
we think that this is the way to go and this is the way forward. Uh, down the road, in the future, we see refineries that are making only petrochemicals. Molecule management is critical and the use of the right technologies is critical to get you to where you want to be. Hydrogen addition pays back because you make more olefins and aromatics. New technology innovation, I think the society did a great job choosing topics because this is what the world is discussing now, is bottom of battle upgrading and process intensification and getting more from bottom of the battle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sani, for this very nice presentation. It's along the same line as the previous one. It's adding value through processing crudes and using them <coughs> as a petrochemical or polymer product rather than using them as a fuel. But actually, at the end of the life cycle of the polymers, 